Hi, everybody. This is Addison Shonland. It is June 16th, 2021. And my smiling guest is Matt George, CEO of Merlin Labs. And Matt, you're sitting in a car at an airport in Boston because you are walked away from the airplane to come and speak to me. Thank you so much. Addison, thanks so much for thanks so much for having me. So tell us about Merlin Labs. What is your what does your company do? Yeah, so Merlin is a venture backed technology company, primarily backed by Google Ventures, first round capital, and a few other major Silicon Valley venture capital firms. Uh, we're based here in Boston, uh, where I am, but we have offices all over the country uh, and a flight test facility in Mojave, California. And we're building hardware and software that allows very large aircraft to fly autonomously uh, to be able to go perform very useful missions, uh, starting out with uh, uh, packages and cargo, uh, but then moving on to other missions. Um, we are developing the autonomy core, so all the things that are traditionally performed by a pilot uh, and putting that into these big, relatively legacy aircraft. Our customers are generally in two buckets. The first bucket of customers uh, are some of the commercial, you know, and partners are some of the commercial freight companies, uh, you know, who are really interested in thinking about how to, you know, move packages and cargo autonomously and semi-autonomously. Uh, and then our other bucket uh, of partners is uh, the DODs. We work very closely with the Air Force and a few others uh, to think about how to take their mobility aircraft and enable those aircraft uh, to go move things a little bit more efficiently. So if I understand correctly, you are taking what would be today be a conventional airplane and making it able to fly without a crew or with one pilot and, and, and it's a technology helper. Yeah, it, exactly. So we're actively flying a bunch of aircraft out in our you know, facility in, in Mojave. The aircraft, uh, we've demonstrated you know, full takeoff to touchdown autonomy uh, on some of our smaller aircraft where the aircraft goes, takes off, performs the mission, comes back down uh, without, without the pilot, uh, you know, touching, touching the controls. Very important to our approach is we are not a remotely piloted approach. So, uh, you know, sometimes when people think of unmanned aircraft or reduced crew aircraft, uh, they think about a remote pilot sitting there and manipulating the controls on the ground. <clears throat> For us, uh, what we're working on is true aircraft level autonomy. Uh, where the aircraft can uh, make its own decisions, think for itself, uh, you know, all on its own. We still fundamentally believe that there needs to be a human operator monitoring those decisions, uh, but not a human operator physically making those decisions and physically manipulating the controls. So we have a human on the loop as opposed to a human in the loop approach uh, to autonomy. What's the biggest airplane that you've uh, enabled so far? Yeah, so the biggest aircraft that we've announced so far is uh, uh, King Air uh, 90 series aircraft. So uh, complex twin turboprop aircraft, uh, uh, you know, which is really cool. Um, you know, we fundamentally believe that in order to be able to go deliver this technology, you need to do it on large, uh, uh, large complex aircraft uh, and being able to go do that on a large twin turboprop uh, you know, aircraft that's used all around the world for a wide variety of different missions is really important to us and something we're really proud of in partnership with a company called Dynamic Aviation, who's been, uh, you know, our partner almost since day one uh, in, in deploying the King Air. And Dynamic is the largest private operator of King Airs in the world. So it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty good fit. So how do you tell the airplane? I mean, turbo props, particularly on the King Air, you've got multiple throttle handles to, to move. How do you optimize all that stuff? Yeah, it's uh, it's definitely a process, right? Not just sort of the throttles, but especially as we move towards, you know, sort of full autonomy and kicking the safety pilot out and things like that. We have to think about circuit breakers, a bunch of ancillary aircraft systems. So when we approach an aircraft like the King Air, we do that in partnership with a subject matter expert like Dynamic Aviation, who knows the ins and outs of the aircraft, who can help our engineers build stuff and build systems that are able to control, you know, as you mentioned, you know, highly complex turboprop engines. Um, but yeah, that's a big part of the challenge that we're tackling and we'll, we'll be announcing some more stuff there soon. Matt, what's the problem you're trying to solve for the, for commercial aviation? What's the problem? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, 
as the world expands, right? And as billions and billions of new consumers come online for the first time, who all want to be able to go buy things and have it delivered to their door the next day, as the world becomes more globalized, as the world becomes more connected, the growing world population needs to think about how to use the air in a different way. So what we're doing at Merlin is creating an autonomous layer that is able to go over the world, uh, be able to go connect the world, and be able to use the air above us in a new and novel way. So doing what we're doing, we're able to take a very large aircraft, put it up in the air autonomously, and the aircraft can go deliver packages, uh, eventually be able to go search for forest fires and a bunch of other missions that fundamentally improve life on the ground by making the sky more accessible. Uh, and that's our mission at Merlin. So how, how, walk us through the automation and, and how it might be deployed. So you mentioned fire, you know, monitoring, uh, let's say, forests for firefighting. So that's, that's an interesting thing. So can you give us some more examples? Because for, with, with something like this, where you're doing something so novel, it might help for, for well, not just me, but probably <laughs> some of the people who are going to watch this to get a grasp of what you, what, where, where you're going with this. Yeah, so there's a bu bunch of missions, you know, including point-to-point -point cargo and, you know, that 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 looks like just any other instrument flight. Uh, you know, our aircraft, uh, what we're designing, is able to go fly a standard instrument departure, uh, you know, follow air traffic control instructions in route, talk back to the air traffic controller and land. Um, but for other missions, like, you know, firefighting, being able to go deploy an aircraft, uh, you know, up, over an area of interest for a long period of time with a C2 link back to the ground, uh, you know, is really compelling. Right now, uh, we're using very, very expensive purpose-built drones to, to be able to go do that. Um, so for instance, in the California wildfire season, you know, at some point we were using RQ4s and MQ9s to be able to go, you know, sort of look for forest fires, but those are really expensive platforms. So by being able to go take a platform that's already mission proven, like the King Air, enable that aircraft to eventually be able to go fly autonomously to go perform those missions, we can put a lot more sensors uh, out over, you know, forests and other places to be able to go and monitor for that information, you know, that the end user needs. So if you take out the human payload, you can put in other things. They can perform the tasks that that you set the airplane up for. Exactly, uh, you know, and the the missions that we're focused on are sort of the dull, dirty, and dangerous missions. So, uh, being able to go send a human out way far out over the ocean, you know, in an aircraft, you know, is is even in a turboprop aircraft. Uh, you know, something that a lot of pilots would prefer not to do. Uh, sending an aircraft out into a fire, a forest fire is something a lot of human pilots would prefer not to do. Or sitting up in the air for eight or nine hours, uh, you know, without a bathroom aboard is something human pilots would prefer not to do. Uh, so being able to go take those dull, dirty, and dangerous missions and bring autonomy to those, those mission sets is something that we're doing. Uh, and it also enables our operators to take a very limited pool of pilots um, you know, as we've seen with the airlines spinning back up, the pilot shortage is right back to where we were prior to, uh, you know, prior to all this, uh, be able to go use a limited pool of pilots to be able to go perform way more missions. Well, now that you bring up pilots, it's something that's been sort of gnawing at the back of my mind here. That's a group of people that are not going to be entirely thrilled with what you're doing here because th there's very easy mission creep from what you're doing into flying freighters. Right. Yeah. So when we're when we're thinking about you know what we're doing, it's still pretty core and still still pretty developmental. Uh, so there's a there's a long pathway between where we are now and uh, you know where uh, you know some of those some of those issues will crop up. And eventually, you know, we are really truly focused on those dull, dirty, and dangerous missions that are either not being performed by human pilots uh or allow a human pilot to be able to go perform you know a much more cognitively uh relevant mission i'll give you an example so in the air force uh we're taking people out of fighter jets and telling them to go fly an isr drone to be able to go watch you know the ocean to do maritime patrol um, but somebody who trained to be an f-16 pilot does not want to be sitting doing a maritime patrol mission uh, in a you know cubicle remotely piloting an aircraft. So if we can bring autonomy to those types of mission sets and enable that F-16 pilot to be able to go fly F-16s, uh, that's something that's really in our wheelhouse and, and what we're trying to be able to go do to help address those dull, dirty, and dangerous missions that a lot of pilots don't want to perform. So how far are you down the road so, uh, at this time in, in terms of developing a product 
or a service? Yeah, so we'll be able to go announce some some certification stuff, you know, in the future. Uh, we are actively working, uh, you know, with a bunch of the regulators, and, and that partnership with the regulator is really important. It's a core part of what we're doing. Uh, we've had a fantastic relationship with our regulator, um, you know, both here and uh, you know, a regulator overseas, uh, you know, and that's really core part of bringing this to to market. I think a lot of companies have this vision of you know, developing a brand new type of aircraft or a brand new type of service and saying, well, if I engineer it well enough, the regulator will just rubber stamp it. And as we know that that, that is not at all true uh, and that this process is truly, uh, you know, a bi-directional partnership with the regulator uh, as we bring, bring the product to market. I, uh, I guess you're still in the development phase, but can you give um, us an idea of what does the, the what's the cost to an airplane owner to have this technology installed? Yeah, we're still a while away from that. Uh, you know, the, the systems are still pretty experimental. Uh, you know, we're working with a couple customers to start to think about cost and, and things like that. Um, but at the end of the day, the systems will need to be less expensive uh, than, you know, a comparable human pilot, more effective and just as safe. And that's a pretty high barrier uh, and a pretty high bar. Uh, and some we're working to deliver, you know, over the next couple of years. Can you give us an idea of how much weight your system adds to an airplane? What's the, you know, if you take out a human yeah, pilot. Yeah, very much depends on the airplane and how. Go ahead. Yeah, the very much dependent on the airplane uh, and sort of how much stuff you have to retrofit and replace in the airplane, typically well under a hundred pounds. Well, that's going to be equivalent of a very light pilot. You might have frozen there for a second, Addison. Oh, okay. I just said that um, the 100 pounds is equivalent of a very light pilot. So that's, uh, that's a lot of weight saving. Give us an idea, if you look five hours, five years out, what, what should we be expecting from Merlin? Yeah, five years out, I think we'll, we'll be flying a bunch of aircraft commercially, uh, which is really exciting. As I mentioned before, uh, being able to go fly experimental aircraft craft is one thing, getting them certified and getting these systems certified, even if there's pilots in the loop, uh, you know, out into part 135 service is, is a whole other thing. So, you know, in five years, I think you'll see high levels of automation out there in part 135 service uh, with the aircraft going, you know, taking off, flying an instrument route, flying an instrument uh, arrival, landing all by themselves without a human pilot touching, uh, touching the controls in a part 135 environment. This is very interesting. Matt, thank you so much for your time. Addison, thanks so much.